care policy in the United States. Next, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight we're honored to have a discussion with former Senator Tom Daschle. He was on the campus of South Dakota State University earlier this year for a presentation with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. There is no question of Tom Daschle's commitment to improving health care policy. In his 2008 book, Critical, what can we do about the health care crisis? He outlines the reasons to reform the health care system. It contains many recommendations, some of which became a part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, more commonly known as the ACA. After our visit with Senator Daschle, Dr. Tom Dean of Washington Springs, South Dakota, will join us to continue the discussion. Dr. Dean was a part of the 17-member Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or the MedPAC, an independent federal commission, part of the Congress, that advises them. MedPAC was established by the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Its primary role is to advise the U.S. Congress on issues affecting the administration of health care Medicare program. But before we begin, Let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. The Affordable Care Act, or ACA, increased access for people to obtain medical insurance coverage in South Dakota. True or false? We'll answer this quiz at the end of tonight's program. We begin now with our conversation with Tom Daschle. Senator Daschle, uh, it must have been some time early in your Washington experience that you became interested and knowledgeable about health care policy. What got that started? Well, it starts with a belief that two of the most fundamental things in any society are education and health care. I've always believed that if you're healthy and well-educated, the sky's the limit in what you can do. But my specific health policy uh, interest started on the Veterans Committee. I was a Vietnam veteran, Vietnam era oh, veteran, that's it. and worked with uh, Vietnam veterans as they were coming back from Vietnam on two things in particular, PTSD and Agent Orange. And that interest in their health care led me to a broader interest over time, and uh, it became a passion of mine over the years. You know, in the United States, compared to the rest of the world, we are first in the most expensive health care per capita. And yet, uh, in 2010, the New England Journal gave us 37th in quality. I know birth, uh, birth uh, safety and baby issues are also uh, recently shown to be still. We're way down the line in quality. Uh, even with the ACA, do you sense that there's something within the ACA that could make that better? Oh, absolutely. I, I think we're getting started. I think there's, there are ACA challenges all the way through the policy process. Cost, access, and quality are all three important issues. Uh, and let's just say ACA is also the PPACA, the Patient Protection and Accountable Care Act, which is right. also known as Obamacare, but we call it ACA. Yeah. Yeah. So I interrupted you. Well, I, I was just saying, I, I think that, that we have a lot, we've done reasonably well on access. We still have 10, over 10 million people to go if we're going to have the universal coverage. That's the stated goal of the ACA. But we have enormous challenges both on quality and cost. Uh, you correctly state how much it costs per capita. That's 100% that's more. The, the mo second most expensive country is Switzerland, and they spend about $6,500 a year. So we're, we're well over the second most expensive country in the world. I've always looked at health care, and I, I think we've talked about this before, as taking the shape of a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid, you have primary care, uh, the cheapest and in some ways by far the most accessible and effective care. Cuba makes a, uh, a, a whole case for exclusive primary care. But as you go up the pyramid, you become more and more sophisticated, expensive, and technical until at the very top of the pyramid, you have heart transplants and technical applications to help. Every society starts at the base of the pyramid and they work their way up until the money runs out. 
In the United States, we start at the top of the pyramid and we work our way down until the money runs out. So our care is a lot more expensive because we use the most expensive kinds of care in delivering our system. That's only with. one of the reasons. We also have a fee-for-service system that rewards uh, volume. The more we spend, the more volume we get technically in the name of getting better care, but more volume often doesn't equate to better care. That's a second issue. We have very little transparency. Healthcare is the only sector of the economy where at the time of purchase, we don't know what it's gonna cost or who's gonna pay. And so you have all these issues. We don't put the emphasis on quality and value. And as we're talking about value, we don't have good quality measurements today. Our measurements are too opaque. Um, the national, uh, the, 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 there are several different entities that that are, uh, are, are, are are designated with the responsibility we have over 1350 quality measurements in use today and you can't possibly figure out a way to no. maximize quality with that many different ways to measure it no I, I think measuring measuring quality is a very difficult thing I mean as a primary care guy they're trying to measure my quality and sometimes that means that oh I don't want to cover that particular diabetic who doesn't follow the rules very well because I get gamed. So uh, quality is a very challenging uh, issue. Uh, but certainly cost is, is one. Uh, and of course, they, the ACA is said not to uh, reduce the cost very well, but it has improved coverage. Explain the coverage issue to me a little bit more. How well has the ACA done in covering people who before the ACA did not have coverage? Well, the ACA has done a phenomenal job, it seems to me, in addressing many of the deficiencies. There are a lot of problems with regard to coverage. One is there are a lot of people that had pre-existing conditions and couldn't get coverage even if they could afford it. And so this eliminates all of the pre-existing conditions. It eliminates a lot of the impediments that existed before to get coverage. So that's one way to do it. Secondly, it offers far more options for purchasing private insurance with subsidies than we've ever had before. Uh, a typical person now pays under $100 for, uh, for a silver plan in the Affordable Care Act, which is dramatically lower than what it would be on the marketplace without the ACA. But the difference, of course, is the subsidy or the tax credit that they're eligible for. The third thing that the ACA does is offer Medicaid expansion, uh, providing more benefits to more people in those states that choose to use it. There are about 30 states now that have expanded the Medicaid program. Uh, South Dakota is not is one, not one, but they're in negotiations with the Department of Health and Human Services as we speak. And I'm got my fingers crossed and knock on wood and hope that it works. Me too. But uh, that would be wonderful if we could get them to uh, be the 31st state. So there are a lot of different ways that ACA has expanded coverage, and I would even say it's had an impact on cost. This is the lowest cost we've seen in healthcare. Uh, I should say cost growth we've seen in healthcare now in over 25 years. So we've seen some effect on cost. We haven't seen it come down, we, but we haven't seen it grow like it has in recent years. Now the critics would say that the reason that the growth reduced from 8% a year to 3%, much of that was due to the, the recession that occurred about at the same time. And then, but most will have to admit that some of that has to do with the ACA. Uh, but it's still growth. Uh, and some radical things should be done, don't you think? I mean, there's a lot of waste. How do we do that? I mean, uh, without overcoming the bureaucratic burden that you put on the physician's head or the care provider's head. Well, I've always said that I think there is bipartisan agreement on what our goal should be. I think our goal should be to produce or to build a high performance, high value healthcare marketplace with better access, better quality, and lower cost emphasis on each one of those five components. Better access, better quality, and lower cost brings you better value and, and higher quality and, and better performance. And so our goal is to create a mechanism, an infrastructure that allows us to do that. I think the ACA moves us uh, partway down the field. I tell people that I think we're at about the 30 yard line with 70 yards to go. The ACA will not get us to the goal line. We still have to do a number of things. Yeah. but. 
by putting the emphasis on value and migrating away from fee for service, by putting the emphasis on transparency so that people have a, bar, a far better understanding of what, what quality measurements might apply in their circumstances, and especially putting the emphasis on transparency for cost will help us produce that high performance, high value marketplace. Transparency, but that's a different, that means a difficult, uh, it is. Difficult, it is. Difficult challenge. Not impossible. So one of the things that's happened is a number of insurance companies have jumped on board to try to provide this. And I personally believe that it's a better idea to, do, uh, to allow insurance companies to try to control costs and to provide uh, uh, health care uh, financing than to just immediately dump all those and go right to a single payer system. And we can talk about that. But some of the insurance companies, ones not connected to the hospital businesses, have realized a tremendous burden by uh, trying to do that coverage because people who needed it all these years have jumped on board. Their costs are quite large. And the young people who are supposed to buy insurance that kind of offsets the cost of the people who, who are using the money are not getting insured. Uh, it's they're the, 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 uh, the gig that they're supposed to have to make them get insured is not big enough uh, and or they think they're invincible or what can we, uh, do you agree with me on that and what can we do to change that? Well, I think the glass is either half full or half empty depending on your outlook. Since the ACA was passed, four and a half million young adults under the age of 26 have signed up on their parents' plans. That's so good. That is good. That's, uh, that's a real beginning. Uh, but your point is well taken. They, they, I think we call them, and they call themselves the young invincibles for yeah. a reason. They think they're invincible, and, and it's also partly a, a, an economic question. Oftentimes they don't feel they have the capacity to pay, but that's less the reason these days, given the subsidies that oftentimes they would be entitled to. I think we just have to continue to educate, continue to, and as you know, the penalty for noncompliance goes up with each passing year. It's, uh, it's going to be into the thousands of dollars in the, in the next few years, and so there will be a harsh penalty, uh, relatively speaking, for a lot of uh, young people if they don't. So I think the combination of more education, making sure people know what their options are, and there are some good options for young adults, and then understanding the penalties for noncompliance, I think will move us in the right direction. Okay. Um, the, uh, what I was, one of the things that I was thinking about had to do with uh, what you, your comment on, on uh, the broad base, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, the primary care uh, health uh, provider. Uh, that's, a, that's a general internist, that's a family physician, that's nurse practitioners and PAs. Uh, what in the ACA is going on to improve that uh, push to, get to, to uh, increase? We need more of those uh, and we're not seeing quite as many and as, as people get insurance they're going to need more primary care instead of going to the specialist. What can we do to improve that? Well, the ACA again does a number of things that I think uh, will, will certainly help a lot. Number one, as we define the benefits uh, for ACA participants, for the beneficiaries of the ACA, we define a series of categories of care that have to be provided. And for the first time, primary care is part of that that defined benefit uh, uh, requirement, that mandate for insurance companies. So primary care has to be offered for coverage. Number two, we, we have set aside funding specifically to uh, increase reimbursements under Medicare for primary care physicians, not nearly as much as it should be. Uh, but, and it's threatening to go away. And it is, the, and it has, a, it has a definitive time frame within which that is made available, which I think is wrong. The third thing is we're incenting medical schools to provide more opportunities for primary care uh, students. And I think that also, but I think the bottom line is pretty simple. It's crass but simple. Follow the money. If we incent primary care at both the consumer and the provider level, we're going to get primary care. What we haven't done adequately, in my view, is incent to the degree we need to get that job done. There's a lot that's good about the ACA that you have, have outlined, and, and I'm, I'm with you on that. But there are many people who are against it. Why do you think that is? 
Well, I think it goes back, uh, well, first of all, I think uh, to a large extent, uh, it's become very political and ideological. Um, you know, the ACA, without getting political at all, it started out uh, as a proposal by the Republicans and a conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, in 1992. And um, I was in the room when the president made decisions about how we would move the legislation. And while he was encouraged by many in his party to, uh, to offer a single payer plan and then work to the middle, realizing that single payer is probably not politically possible, uh, he decided to, to start in the middle start with the Republican plan that, that was viewed as compromise legislation when it was offered as an alternative to the Clinton plan in 1993. Um, so that's where he started. Uh, all the way through the process, we, we had uh, opportunities for amendments, uh, but I think it's political, it's ideological, and it comes down at its core to what the proper role of government should be in healthcare in America. You know, we started out where government had about a 5% role at the turn of the last century, around the turn of the 20th century. We're now at about 50-50 between what the private sector and the, and the, and the governmental role right. is. We don't have a system in our country. We have a collage of subsystems. Some are public, some are private, uh, some are single payer, some are not. Um, and, and that collage doesn't work very effectively together right now. They're too siloed. And so the effort by the ACA was to create less of a siloed infrastructure, and, uh, but it still involved uh, some additional government, and that rub for a lot of people was more than they were willing to support. Uh, w one of the think tank ideas, though, was an emphasis to, to encourage savings account methods. And uh, that theoretically puts skin in the game of the patient. I think truly, if we're gonna control costs, the patient has to have some skin in the game, which is difficult when they have no money. But if, uh, so what happened to the savings account uh, a method of, of considering healthcare insurance plans? How come we don't have that still going? What can we do to get that back? Well, they, they, they do and they don't. I mean, health savings accounts are, have, ask, have, 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 have pluses and minuses. I, I, you're right, I, I share your view that it is important to the extent you have the ability to have some so-called skin in the game. As you know, out-of-pocket expenses are going up dramatically and it's becoming now a source of very serious and grave concern uh, among people who are monitoring these trends because fewer and fewer people are deciding to postpone care. They can't afford the out-of-pocket expenses. Health savings accounts uh, require huge out-of-pocket expenses, and that then requires people to make choices between health care and groceries or health care and rent. And in many cases, uh, they opt for the options other than health care. So we have to be very careful, I think, about the way these things are fashioned. Yeah, it's a and, balance, isn't it? And the HSA, of course, in, in those cases where they provide all the required benefits, um, they're, they're certainly entitled to operate today. The problem is most HSAs, most health savings accounts, don't have all of the prescribed benefits required under the Affordable Care Act. Explain really quickly what a health savings account is. Health savings account is, is your ability to set aside money for health and not have to pay tax on it. It's pre-tax dedication of money for health care that uh, is not taxed. Um, and, and then used for health purposes as long as that out-of-pocket expense is covered. And, and so you decide, okay, this is money out of my pocket if I go to the doctor. Exactly. So uh, the people who get hit mostly are going to be primary care. Exactly. And once they reach their thing, well, they'll go and get their heart transplant. So it doesn't work perfectly, does no, it? not no. at all. Uh, one of the th other huge costs of, of health care, right now it's just exploding in front of my eyes, is pharma. I mean, pharma is, you know, even the genetic, generics, uh, pharmaceutical industry has seemed to go by way of, of, uh, of conglomerates such that the small guys that are making a cheaper op option, it's not there. And so uh, I, I'm struggling with the, with the price of colchicine that used to be $4 is now $200 or $300, and the price of simple antihypertensive drugs are skyrocketing. 
what can we do to help control the cost of, of pharma, pharmaceuticals? What, and, and then, of course, all of the, uh, the fancy new drugs for chemotherapy and uh, rheumatologic things. They're just huge. And that's a big part of the cost of healthcare. Where is the answer there? Well, it, there, there is no simple answer. I, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a company that has gained great notoriety. Uh, I'll even call it out because it's been in the media a lot, Valiant. Valiant is a company that buys small drug companies with one or two products and then marks up the product by two and three hundred percent almost the day after it makes a purchase of this particular company. That kind of thing ought to be prohibited in whatever way we can under public law uh, for companies to take advantage of the monopoly they have on certain drugs as Valiant does is just outrageously inexcusable. I, I, there's a legitimate case to be made for research. Um, Savaldi is a good example. Savaldi was created uh, recently in, in the last couple of years uh, as a drug to cure uh, hepatitis C, an amazing new drug that actually cures an illness that we a few years ago thought was, was beyond cure. And so it's amazing the life-changing abilities that some of these drugs have. Uh, so we want to protect research, but at the same time, we want to be sure that we can find ways to address these extraordinary costs, especially if they're unnecessary, and finding that balance is going to be critical. What I think there is consensus about today is going back to another thing we've already talked about quite a bit, and that's transparency. There is very little transparency on what costs go in to the production and uh, the development okay. of a drug today. So having that greater transparency may be one way to begin this process of getting more control on costs. I hate to have the government go in and say, no, this price is going to be this, and then we're going to take your private enterprise right away to raise the price and so on. But at the same time, I'm torn by this. A lot of people talk about going to Canada or Mexico to get their drugs. Uh, that's kind of a short-term not a true picture. A government can't go to Canada to get the price. I mean, what's the answer on the idea of going elsewhere for the low price drugs? Well, medical tourism is really becoming quite a big industry, as you know. People are going not only to Canada and Mexico, but they're going to Thailand and they're going to places uh, at some distance to not only get drugs, but to get other care, other surgical procedures done, and a whole array of services in large measure because of the problem that you so rightly uh, emphasize on cost uh, and quality. I mean, if we're only 34th in the overall uh, scheme of things worldwide on quality, and you can get a surgical procedure done at higher quality and lower cost, it may be worth a couple of thousand dollar airfare to go there to do it. Yeah. And that's what more and more people are doing. In fact, some insurance companies are encouraging you to do exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. So let the, the, the competition begin. I yes, mean, well that's say. partly what the world's about in the future, no question. So uh, some people would say that uh, when, uh, if the Republican president uh, or becomes a Republican president, if there's a Republican president, that, uh, and there's a Republican Congress, that they'll take down the ACA and start anew. What do you think about that? Well, I think that is a possibility. There have been 56 votes to repeal the Affordable Care Act in the House uh, in the last five years, 56. There have been a couple of votes in the Senate. <clears throat> because the president has clearly said, that, with no surprise to anybody, that he'd veto the legislation, it really hasn't gotten anywhere. But if there was a, a Republican president and, and substantial majorities in the House and the Senate, um, the Republican majorities, uh, that is a very uh, possibility. I think the real question, and I, I take some satisfaction in this, is that there's absolutely no consensus uh, among Republicans as to how they'd replace the Affordable Care Act. If we all understand that we, we have cost problems, we have access problems, we have quality problems, how, if not through the ACA, are we going to fix it? And no one has, we've, we've seen a couple of presidential candidates now who have said, well, here's my solution. And I will say they're, they, they fall far short 
of the comprehensive solution required to replace the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in many cases, there are nothing but warmed over ideas that have already been proved to be wrong. One good example are, are, are these um, uh, risk pools for the uninsured. We've had risk pools, as you know, for decades, and the risk pools have never worked. And so to go back to risk pools after all of this would really be a, 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 a shame. But those risk pools are a central part of a lot of these alternative plans. And uh, I think we've got to be very cognizant of the progress we've made, the support there is among the American people for that progress, and build and try to improve on what we've done. Uh, one of the Republican comments is about the death panels, quote unquote. Uh, uh, and I think they're referring more to the Independent Payment Advisory Board component of the uh, ACA. Uh, that, that, that there's going to be, how dare they consider doing some kind of rationing in health care. My answer, of course, is it was in the face of all of us who are trying to help people have choices and advance directives when at the end of their lives they're suffering and it's time to just give comfort care and, and, uh, and so on. Um, what is your comment about the Republican uh, death panel fears that have been lauded upon the public? I, you know, I'm, I'm just frankly so disappointed and troubled by that hyperbolic incendiary rhetoric. It, it does such a disservice. I think we've got to address end of life. My family is dealing with that issue as we speak. And I think we have to do a better job of addressing end of life issues. And I think there are a lot of ways we can do that, giving people more options, um, encouraging states to allow people to take more control of their lives at the end of life, as California just decided to do, and Oregon and Washington have already done. I think there are a lot of things. I think we've got to teach that death is not always the enemy in medical school. Uh, we don't do a good enough job of that. I think we're working on that. We are. We are. I think we're, and, and uh, we, we need to not have a paranoia about, uh, at the end, not doing everything. Uh, and fortunately, that's where we spend so much of our money and that's it's exactly wasted. Right. No, it is. It is. It's wasted, and it's uh, painful, oftentimes, for the person yeah. most, uh, most uh, in the center of this whole decision-making process. And so, but, but but as for the IPAB, I, I strongly support it. There was a requirement in there when the law was passed. Independent Payment Advisory Board. Right. Uh, there was a requirement that whatever they well, first of all, they, they can't even. Uh, well, number one, it hasn't been appointed yet because it is so controversial. Two, they can't even uh, use their authority until the growth exceeds uh, our, our inflation plus 1%. Uh, so that would mean, in this case, roughly 4%. We're not even close to that. So they'd have to sit on the sidelines in any case until we get into an inflationary period. And then third, once they look at options for reducing health care costs, which everybody acknowledges is a problem, one thing that is in law they're not allowed to do is touch benefits. So they've got to come up with ways to address costs, costs without addressing benefits. That's in the law. So, so you're not afraid of it at all? Absolutely not. It's, uh, it's just a small step to what I think is going to have to be done to address costs in the oh, future. We have got to do something more. In it. But there are people who say, and, and they're frightened of this board, this powerful board that's going to control everything and and pull the plug on grandma and all that. Uh, they're saying that uh, it's going to be a terrible, terrible thing. And, and so I, some people say, though, that it is similar to what you have written about in your book, uh, The Federal Health Board. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your book, Crisis, What Can We Do About It, uh, about the health care uh, crisis in 2008, pre-ACA. Uh, you went for a single-payer system instead of uh, 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 keeping the insurance business alive. Well, quasi-single-payer. I mean, we already have a single-payer system in, in both Medicaid and Medicare. So a, a big portion of our population and the Veterans Administration, of course, all use single-payer. And, and so it's not foreign to the United States in any way, shape, or form. Um, but having said that, as I said a moment ago, we have a collage of subsystems. And ironically, and, or coincidentally, 
very similar to the collage of subsystems we had in banking 100, uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, we had public banks, we had private banks, we didn't have a federal bank at that time, uh, at least in the way we have it now. So we created the Federal Reserve System to coordinate our monetary system more effectively and, by the way, take it out of politics. Uh, and my, my, my quintessential question, the question that I think makes my case better than any, is if it were up to Congress today to raise and lower the interest rates and to control monetary policy, where do you think we'd be? Fortunately, <laughs> you know, we learned from the, 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 the near depression we had in 2008 and 2009 how critical the Federal Reserve was in getting us out of the crisis that we face. Huge crisis, one of the biggest we faced in all of American history. Well, the Fed helped save our bacon. Um, so what I thought was, why not use that same concept and apply it to health care just as we applied it to banking. It's no different. Right. Uh, taking this collage and making more sense of it, tearing down the silos, having a coordinated policy all over the country just seemed to me to make so much sense. Um, if we like it in banking, if we realize that Congress doesn't have the capacity to deal with monetary policy, why is it that we think Congress is any more able to deal with the difficult issues that you face every day in health care? Why not have more of an independent board who can make assessments based on the medical uh, Need. facts and needs that we're facing as a country and dealing with the waste and the problems that inherently we have in this infrastructure today? That was the whole idea behind the Federal Reserve. And, and the IPAB, or the Independent Payment uh, Board, is similar in well, one sense. It's in a, one it, sense. It's, it's a supposed to be isolated. Piece, right, exactly. Is it, though? No. Well. It's not even, it doesn't even exist today because we've not created uh, an opportunity for a board to actually meet. We don't have one nominee. The president hasn't made the appointments because he knows that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be confirmed, and so it's in limbo, frankly. So address one of the major issues that doctors face every day, healthcare providers, is the burden of what look used to look like a really great thing called the electronic health record, electronic medical record. And I was Mr. Push It, great, let's get one at the Brookings Clinic, I mean, way ahead of ourselves, uh, let's do it because look at the advantages and the, and the information that we could share and immediate uh, information about things. But right now, as it is, it has been built, my words, to generate uh, funding. I mean, to raise, to pay the bills, and to protect us from a lawsuit. And it's not been built to communicate it about the health care of the patient, and it has been put on the shoulders of the care provider. So we spend too much time away from our patient, typing on the doggone thing, check blanks, and end up with an empty box full of check boxes. Uh, I'm frustrated with it, and I'm sounds like it. And it was pushed by the ACA, and uh, so what's your response to that? Well, I, I, we're going through a transformative period that is very uncertain and difficult to adjust. I still strongly believe in electronic health records because I think uh, everything is going electronic. <clears throat> technology is not the panacea, but technology can help catalytically bring about better care. It can bring about far more data analysis. It can bring about the quality measurements that we lack today. It can bring about greater transparency. It can bring about more portability. It can bring about the kind of opportunities for team-based care that doesn't exist today. There's so many things that technological applications can bring. But this is a, 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 a really tough and transformative period where the transition is not easy. You said it's it. very painful, yes. but I think at the end of the day it's going to be well worth the fight. Well, it, 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 I, I hope so. Uh, unfortunately, there's so little communication even between similar systems and different hospitals and clinics. The communication between, it is not enhanced by it. And the story is being lost. So, I've said my political comment about that. I know that you're um, a leader right now, uh, even though your, your Senate experience is, is over, uh, you are bringing 
leadership towards bipartisanship in this country, which is, I think, the most laudable thing. Uh, my hat's off to you on that. Tell me about your efforts to bring the Republicans and the Democrats together. Well, I think it began with the realization that things were getting worse when I left the Senate uh, already. And uh, so George Mitchell, Bob Dole, Howard Baker, and I, four past majority leaders, founded a new organization called the Bipartisan Policy Center. And its whole purpose was to create a venue for Democrats and Republicans to share ideas. We didn't want to give up our identity as Democrats or Republicans or liberals or conservatives, but, but to share ideas and find common ground on the issues that are facing our country today. Uh, that was in 2007. Uh, I wish I could say we've made more progress in creating this bipartisan climate in Washington. If anything, I think it's still gotten worse. But we have been able to come up with ideas on health care, on energy, on transportation, on a whole array of different challenges we're facing, housing, um, and, and, and present ideas that, that at least reflect the common ground that the BPC represents. Trent Lott and I, former Majority Leader Trent Lott and I, uh, we're part of a project on better governance. How can we deal with the dysfunction in Washington today? We came up along with a series of, of uh, uh, and, uh, along with other members, 24 other members of this task force, with a series of ideas that we have now uh, put into the form of a book, and it'll be out in December, uh, in, in January. Name, and, what, uh, what's the name of this The book? name of the book is called Crisis Point, and, uh, and it's reflective of our view of the situation we're currently experiencing. We're at a crisis point in Washington. Washington has never been this dysfunctional. Uh, going all the way back to the Civil War, to 100, 160 years ago. And so we've got to address the challenges we're facing to make Washington function again. We're hoping that some of these ideas will gain enough traction to get support. So with that bipartisan spirit, do you think, I mean, what do you sense is gonna happen uh, to the ACA and to health care in the next five years? I mean, what's your, what's your hope? What's your expectation? Well, I think there's going to be um, efforts to try to build on what we've done. I, I, I don't want to be myopic about it, but I have a number of close friends and associates on the Republican side, and I'll cite uh, two of them in particular. Senator Bill Frist, he was the, the final physician. Republican leader I worked with, a physician. Uh, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, Secretary Thompson, Mike Levitt, a Republican from, uh, from Utah, a former Secretary of Health and Human Services and Governor. They are extraordinarily thoughtful people that share many of the same ideas that, that I have. Mark McClellan is another, the former CMS uh, uh, director, uh, administrator. So we have a number of Republicans who want to find the common ground and move our country forward on cost, quality, and access. And uh, so I'm encouraged. I mean, I, I would just cite a couple of things that have happened even in this Congress. One is we passed the SGR re, re, uh, right. oh. repeal, the sustainable is... growth rate, which set the, the reimbursement rate for doctors, including you, and, and uh, it was overwhelmingly bipartisan. And, and we, we extended the community health centers for two years, overwhelmingly bipartisan. We passed the 21st Century Cures in the House, a research bill to try to address the many challenges we face in research, overwhelmingly bipartisan. So there, I think there are some ideas and some, some policy perspectives that already enjoy broad bipartisan support, and I hope we can build on that. So, uh and so you're, you're positive. You're feeling very positive about all of this. Uh, well, as I say, I don't want to be myopic. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 but I, I also think that you've got to think positive and look for you know, those glimmers of hope. And I find glimmers of hope today. Madeleine Albright, uh, uh, a year ago, you, you brought a Republican uh, into uh, Trent Lott into uh, Brookings, South Dakota, and SDSU to present these bipartisan ideas. This year, you've brought in Madeleine Albright, Madam Secretary uh, of State, uh, uh, years past. Uh, what has uh, your, what's your sense about Madeleine Albright? What kind of a lady is, grand lady is this? I am a huge admirer of uh, Secretary Albright. She's the 64th Secretary of State, first woman. She's a prolific author, best-selling author. She's, uh, 
She was presented the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, she was born in Czechoslovakia, found her way as a Czechoslovakian young girl to Denver, Colorado, uh, and be got her doctorate degree and, uh, uh, and has risen to the highest positions in government today. Thank you My so much. My pleasure. Enjoyed Great. it. You're not you when you have the flu. Get vaccinated, because stopping the flu starts with you. For several years, our country has experienced intense, often passionate debate about reforming health care services. Given these complicated discussions, it is useful, I think, to ask, why are we doing all this in the first place? The answer is that the health of our population and the care they receive simply is not as good as it should be. We spend more on health care than any other country, but when compared with 37 other developed countries, the U.S. ranks 30th in life expectancy. That's 30th out of 38. We are tied with Chile and behind Greece, Italy, and Slovenia. Our infant mortality rates rank 35th out of 38. Senator Daschle is correct. The fundamental challenges we face are cost, access, and quality. I would put the focus on cost and quality. Access is largely a secondary problem resulting from the high costs. Why are costs so high? The major cost drivers are higher health care prices in the U.S., poorly coordinated care, more costly procedures, and an immensely complex system where administrative costs consume as much as 25% of the total bill. U.S. physician practices spend four times as much on administration as do physicians in Canada providing the same services. Furthermore, current payment structures provide no incentive for providers to practice in efficient and cost-effective ways. All too often, the incentives are actually in the opposite direction. The more one does, the more one gets paid, whether or not the extra interventions contribute to a better outcome for the patient. So what about the ACA, Obamacare? With the ACA, we have made some progress in the right direction. Contrary to what the critics charge, the, AC has not, the ACA has not led to runaway costs. In the last five years, cost increases have been significantly lower than in the preceding years. Medicare solvency has been extended. Access has improved. The number of uninsured Americans is at the lowest level in decades. Quality has improved. The number of hospital readmissions has declined and hospital complications have been reduced. All of this is encouraging, but it is only a start. We must remember that we are dealing with a huge and enormously complex system. The challenges are confusing and highly vulnerable to misrepresentation and demagoguery. There are no quick fixes. Change is resisted by powerful forces that benefit from the existing structures, special interest lobbies protecting their piece of the pie. As a society, we are committed to free market principles, but the economics of health care all too often demonstrate abject market failure. Effective health care is a vital component of any modern society. We need to support changes that reward efficient and effective care. These services must be available to our entire population. We must move beyond the political and ideological battles that stifle creativity and block progress. People of good faith with differing perspectives should come together and not fear compromise. We need to move beyond the cries for repeal, build on the accomplishments we have, and move toward the high-functioning healthcare system the U.S. public deserves. And now we welcome Dr. Tom Dean to our studio. Tom, you know, you're, you're a small town, Westington Springs, family physician. How in the world did you get on that 
fabulous, powerful med pack. I mean, what <laughs> got that? I mean, you were in, w involved with a family physician organization, is that and, it? And probably more specifically with the National Rural Health Association. Um, it, it, it's a little hard to answer that question because the appointments to MedPAC it's are, uh, the appointment process is fairly opaque. The appointments are made by the Comptroller General, which uh, is supposed to make it a non-political uh, appointment. But if you spend any time in Washington, you rapidly learn there is no such thing as non-political. <laughs> but, but you're, you're but not anyway. a hot political guy. You're not no, running for office. No, no I'm not running for office. It, it, they, they try to balance the commission. It's, it's a mixture of physicians and administrators and economists and lawyers and actuaries. And, and they were being criticized because there was no one with any rural perspective on at the time yeah. I uh, came in. So that's yeah. really... You have the rural perspective, yeah. and you're well spoken, and you're re well read. Well, we appreciate hope so. that. <laughs> well, and that's why you're here. I mean, uh, you and I have been involved with looking at health care reform the 30 years we've known each other. You're right. And I've watched you be the leader who is this. And if you hadn't been on the Med Pack, it'd still be good to have you on the show. Uh, wasn't that an interesting interview with Doc, with uh, Ta it was. Tom it was. Daschle? My goodness, he is a knowledgeable man. He, he really is, and I think regardless of the politics, and there's you know he has uh, supporters and detractors and so forth, but of all the people in public life, he understands the system better than anybody else I know. I mean, he really has studied. He really understands, it. and it's an incredibly complicated system. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so hard to bring about change because it's it is very confusing. Right. His book, Crisis, though, did recommend this single sort of uh, independent, not political, you know, protected from politics commission to make some decisions that are hard to make mm -hmm. about who gets paid what. Right. Uh, and so uh, the ACA, the, uh, the Health Care Act that uh, President Obama has, has brought to us, has something similar to that, but it hasn't been used yet. Could you talk about that? Well, it's called the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And it, it, he, when Daschle proposed this, he was using the model of the Federal Reserve System. And as he said in the interview, if, if Congress was given the responsibility for determining interest rates, we would be in a terrible mess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he said that, that a lot of the decisions about uh, health care policy are just very technical and very complicated and would be better managed by a group of independent experts. And, and so the, the structure is that if the increase in costs uh, for Medicare exceeds a certain threshold, then this commission, or board, I guess it is, would be tasked with the uh, responsibility to come up with ways to bring those costs back into line. And, and then that, that recommendation would go to Congress. But they, the place that it was really given clout was they would have to vote it up or down, and they couldn't amend it. And so that upset a lot of people in Congress. And, but, but this only would apply if the rate of increase exceeded a certain point, and over the last few years it is not. So the board does not even exist at this point. Right, right, right. So, uh, but why is it receiving so much criticism? Well, the congressional folks are not happy that they don't some other group would be given this kind of responsibility. Right. So you hear a lot about unelected bureaucrats, quote unquote. Uh, they're really not bureaucrats, but they would be experts from a variety of fields. But unelected people being given this kind of uh, power, and, and it would be powerful. But, but the one thing that there's a phrase in, or a uh, section of the law that says they cannot reduce benefits. So it, it, the, the first assumption would be, well, they'll just cut benefits to the enrollees. But there is a, a section of the law that, that prohibits that. So the, the recipients are, are protected. So if you were summarizing what uh, is happening in uh, healthcare financing, it is that, w number one, we need to try to make sure that everybody has access to health care. Yes. And the second part is to control the costs. I, was, I heard that after the ACA was passed that we got a B plus on access and it got a D plus on cost. And, and I think that uh, listening to the, even reading this week to the journals that have come out, uh, they're talking about what can we do about costs. It hasn't done as well as it must. I know it slowed it down. We know that it slowed down the, the increase mm -hmm, in cost. Mm -hmm. 
but it, uh, the rate of increase is down, quote unquote. Now, that disgusts me, though. We should be able to reduce the cost because there is at least, they say, 30 percent uh, waste. What could we do? Is I mean, uh, there's some suggestion about the marketplace being the place for that to occur. Why is it not working? What can we do to make the cost controlled? What changes to uh, the ACA should occur? Well, and there's no simple answer to that question. And one of the really valuable parts of the ACA is there it supports a number of, of new models to look for ways. There's the, the uh, a way that uh, the new models that to try to see if we can figure out if different structures and that might be more efficient and introduce some incentives into the system right. to reward providers that really do provide good care at reasonable costs. And right now, those incentives don't exist. There, is there a possibility that some kind of reform could occur? Uh, I know that the people who are, who are trying to vote down the ACA have some suggestions to replace it. Do you see in their suggestions uh, uh, some kind of reform that would allow the marketplace to lower the cost? Well, I think to uh, the market is a remarkable concept. It's a powerful and a very valuable uh, uh, approach to dealing with certain types of commodities Wheat. and so forth. Wheat, you know, Corn. automobiles, yeah. uh, whatever. It, it is much less effective in dealing with a complicated professional service like healthcare. It, it, to, for a market to work, people have to shop around. And if they do that, in healthcare, you get more fragmentation, you get more duplication, you get more inefficiency. You'll lose your doctor. Yeah. And in the other things, in too many parts of healthcare, there just simply isn't any effective competition. And that's most dramatic in today's world with all these new drugs that we hear about that simply don't have competitors and so the producers are allowed to or actually uh, charge whatever they uh, whatever they want and sometimes and and there's really no balance i mean senator Daschle talks about that in this new drug Sovaldi for hepatitis c which is a remarkable drug but there's no competition and so how do you figure out an, a fair price for that i mean the companies deserve to be rewarded for their research but but they're on the other hand the kind of costs uh, deprive a lot of people from other types of care that they would benefit from. If you look at pharmaceutical costs, I mean, that are just so awful. I mean, I can say at the same time, however, the wonderful advances that we've had because of Absolutely. Uh, 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 costs uh, are because of the research of pharmacy. I mean, I just think, you know, somebody asked me to uh, talk about what they can do about maybe going to Canada. This was a, this was mm -hmm. a peer. Uh, people in peer talking about going to Canada. I mean, you know, uh, it's just a complicated deal. I, I hate to be negative about cost uh, uh, pharmaceuticals because they've done some wonderful things, but I'm frustrated with Pfizer deciding to to go to <laughs> Ireland to to avoid taxes. Yeah, um, there's been the suggestion if they're going to go to Ireland to defy, if they're going to pay Irish taxes, we should pay them Irish charges for or what Ireland pays for their drugs, which yeah. is <laughs> dramatically less than what we pay. <laughs> well, we've got just a little time. Um, you would you what would be the bottom line that you would want people to make sure to know about the cost of of care? We we. I think are beginning to recognize that our incentives are not good enough and we need to look for these some of these new models that are supported by the AC and I think that's the most important part of the whole program act the whole law is that it encourages new approaches to care to try to provide some incentives for efficiency and effectiveness very good well you know Tom I thank you so much for being part of this and to coming to Brookings I, one more time. <laughs> Rick, I just want to thank you, and I think the whole state of South Dakota gives both you and your crew here, uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude for this program, which I think is a tremendous value to the people of the state. Well, you can't know how important the crew is. <laughs> They're really important. I know that. <laughs> and now for tonight's uh, answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. The ACA increased access for people to obtain medical insurance coverage in South Dakota, true or false? The answer is true. Do you agree? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I sincerely want to thank our guests tonight, Tom Daschle and Dr. Tom Dean. Their insight into this topic should help us to make the difficult and important decisions that lie ahead. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people.
Funding for On Call with the Prairie Dock is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Swiftel Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doctor is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.